we have a tendency to see our emotions as being especially real, as more real than our thoughts. And many people come to meditation as a way of getting back in touch with their emotions. But from the Buddhist perspective, emotions are just as fabricated as everything else. It's not your real nature. It's not your real truth. You fabricate them, not consciously often. And so one of the important lessons you need to learn in meditation is to see how you fabricate an emotion so you can start fabricating more skillful ones. Again, the idea of a skillful emotion may sound strange, but when you learn that you can consciously direct your emotions, and your emotions do have consequences, you want to direct them in the right direction. Because the problem with an emotion is that it takes hold for a while. And it tends to see things from one side. Lust, for example, tends to come from seeing the body from one side. We're very selective in the things that we focus on when we want to encourage lust. Huge areas of the body that we refuse to look at, refuse to consider. With anger, you focus only on the bad points of the people you don't like. You don't want to look at the good ones. Ill will, partiality, these things come from looking at things from one side only. And when you start acting on these one-sided views, of course it's going to lead to trouble. So it's important that you understand how to fabricate an emotion. The Buddha talks about fabrication and dependent core arising. Fabrication comes from ignorance. That's the whole problem. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of what causes suffering and what doesn't. We're not looking in those terms. We're looking in terms of what we like and don't like. That's ignorance right there. And that then influences the way we fabricate things. And there are three aspects to fabrication. First, there's the breath. This is one of the reasons why the breath is such an important meditation topic, because it comes in right early in the Buddha's description of how suffering arises. If you breathe in an ignorant way, it can cause suffering. And if you look at your emotions carefully, you realize that how you breathe has an impact. on the emotion, and the emotion has an impact on the breath. This is one of the reasons why we tend to have a sense that the emotion is so real, that it's in the body. It's embodied because it's had an impact on the way you breathe, and that's had an impact on the way you sense the rest of the body, other aspects of the body. So the first step in learning how to gain some control over your emotions is learning how to breathe with awareness. In particular, awareness of what kind of breathing is easeful and what kind of breathing is stressful. What kind of breathing is good for the mind, good for the body? What kind of breathing is bad for the mind, bad for the body? Learn to get a sense of cause and effect as it surrounds the breath. This is one of the most important handles you can get on your emotions. But you can reason with the mind and tell it all kinds of good explanations as to why you shouldn't be feeling a particular emotion, and yet it's there. It seems to be lodged in the body. So you have to attack it, not from the side of reason, but from the side of the breath. If when an emotion arises and you can breathe through the tension, breathe through the irregularity of the breath, smooth it out, many times you find that that emotion starts to have less and less power. And then you can work on the other elements of fabrication. There's verbal fabrication, which is directed thought and evaluation, what you tend to focus on and how you tend to evaluate things. 
called verbal fabrications because that's how language gets formed in the mind. You direct your thought, you have a subject for a particular sentence, and then you have your comment on the subject. That's the evaluation. What that means is you want to look at the mental chatter in your mind around that particular object, around that particular issue. When there's lust, exactly what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? What narratives do you have that make the object of your lust appealing? You can start with your own body. There are times when you hate your body. There are times when you love your body. You can notice what kind of dialogue is going on inside the mind with the hatred and with the love. And then when you want to bring things back into balance, try to introduce new topics. When there's one you hate your body, we say, well, what's there to hate about it? The body is useful. It's a necessary part of the path. Developing a sense of rapture through the breath so you can fill the whole body with rapture. There are many passages where the Buddha talks about this. Having the body filled with rapture is an important element of the path. It helps put you in a better mood, helps put you in a better position to see things as they are. With less hunger, with less craving. So you want to get the body on your side, which means you have to learn to see it in a good light as well. Learn how to take proper care of it, and how to breathe in such a way that having the body here does feel full, refreshing, nourishing. On the other side, when you find yourself getting wound up in lust, fascinating with your body and other people's bodies. That's when you've got to look at the other side. We had that chant this morning about the parts of the body. So make those the objects to which you direct your thoughts. There's your liver, there's your intestines, there's the contents of your intestines, there's the bile, all kinds of disgusting stuff in the body. And it's right beneath the skin. You don't have to go down into the intestines, right under the skin. If you took the skin off, you couldn't even look at the body. You'd run away. If someone walked in here without any skin, we'd be out of the sala in no time. And yet that skinless creature is right inside, under our skin. Everybody's sitting in here right now. Of all the meditation topics the Buddha teaches, this is the one that people tend to object to the most, but it's very useful. Because after all, lust can make you do all kinds of crazy things. Most of the murders in the world come from people. Basically the murderer and the murdered person have had sex. If lust were a good thing, it wouldn't turn into murder. But there you are. So you want to make sure that you're not likely to get enslaved to that kind of emotion. And even when you have a partner, if you want to be faithful to your partner, it's good to be able to see other people aside from your partner as unappealing, so you don't start straying away. So this is not just for celibate monks and nuns. It's a useful meditation to have to make sure that you don't get overcome by unskillful emotions. So it's a matter of looking at things from both sides. Same with other people the people that you're really partial to, that you really like. You don't want anything bad to happen to them, but you know that when you're born into this world, bad things are going to happen. It's in the fine print in the contract. There's going to be aging, there's going to be illness, there's going to be death, there's going to be separation. And so you have to learn how to develop equanimity toward the people you love. So when bad things happen to them, you don't get knocked off course that you can remain calm and clear-headed and be as helpful as possible. So you want to practice that ability to, to develop equanimity, even to people that you're really partial towards. As for people you don't like, 
you've got to be able to develop goodwill toward them all the time. Because when you don't feel goodwill for other people, it's easy for you to abuse them physically, verbally, to create all kinds of bad karma for yourself. So it's in your own best interest to learn how to feel goodwill for others, no matter whom, no matter where, in any person, any situation. So when people have wronged you, you have to ask yourself, what good do you get out of their suffering? The little child that likes to see revenge. Do you want to identify with that little child, nasty little creature? And you think about it, if other people could truly be happy inside. And when you wish happiness for people, it doesn't mean that you just wish them to be happy as they are. You wish for them to find the true causes for happiness. So if they really are behaving in harmful ways, you're wishing them for them to see the light. So they can develop a genuine happiness inside. When, they, when people are coming from happiness, they're less likely to be harmful. So it's in your best interest that other people be happy. There's no need to settle old scores, because exactly how far are you going to go back to settle old scores? When we think of justice, we think of a you know, final, final accounting from the beginning to the end. Well, where is the beginning and where is the end? From the Buddhist point of view, the beginning is unknowable. There's that story about some debt, though. One of the junior monks in his monastery came to complain that one of the other monks had hit him. And some Detto said, well, you hit him first. And the junior monk said, no, I didn't. He just came up to me and hit me. He said, and some Detto said, no, you hit him first. So the young monk went complaining to the abbot of another monastery. The other abbot came along to see what he could talk some reason into some Detto. And some Detto said, well, look, in his previous lifetime, they must have hit him. So you don't know how far you have to go back to figure out where is the beginning of this particular problem. So the idea of settling scores once and for all, that's a, that comes from a view of the universe in which there is a beginning and an end. And in, in the Buddhist point of view, you can't know the beginning. And the only end is when you decide to pull out of the whole process. So it's better to wish happiness for everybody and to learn how to make that a, a habit, that you can wish happiness for anybody at any time. So when the time comes to interact with that person, you can act out of goodwill rather than the ill will that's going to cause problems. This is how you use verbal fabrication, direct a thought and evaluation, to create new emotions, more skillful emotions. And then there's mental fabrication, which comes down to feeling and perceptions. And when you learn how to breathe in a way that feels good, feels comfortable inside, it's harder to hold on to a negative emotion. At the same time, you don't feel so hungry, because many times our lust comes out of a hunger for immediate gratification. Well, if you've got a sense of breath energy filling the body with a sense of ease and well-being, you're coming from a less hungry place. And when you're not so hungry, you're more discriminating. When you're hungry, you eat anything that comes your way. When you're feeling full, you look at even sometimes the best food and you say, no, I don't need that. I've got something better right now. I've got all I need. So you're going to use bodily fabrication to induce the proper feelings of mental fabrication. And then there are your perceptions. And this is closely related to verbal fabrication, the labels you have for things. For example, with anger, if you see the, the person who's done you wrong as an evil person, you're going to act in certain ways. If you see that person as a victim of unskillful thinking and unskillful habits, you're going to react in a very different way, a more skillful way. And as for your perception of yourself, you see yourself in a position where you can freely feel anger and hatred for people and not suffer. You're going to give in to the anger more often. But when you realize, as the Buddha says, see yourself as someone who's tired and thirsty, coming across a desert. You need water. Your water is the goodness of other people. So you look for it wherever you can find it. The analogy he gives is you even found a cow footprint in the sand, a little bit of water. 
in that cow footprint and you're really thirsty. That's the water you want. But you know, if you try to scoop it up, you're going to make it muddy. So you get down and you very carefully slurp it out of the footprint. Our position as human beings is that desperate. We need the goodness of other people to nourish our own goodness. So whether you're looking at yourself or looking at other people, learn how to perceive things. The way you label things is really important. The issues of body. Again, your hatred for your body. Why do you hate it? The body's sitting there. It's not doing anything. Or hatred for yourself. You're being a bad person. That's not totally true. You've got your good side as well, and it's important. It's not that your bad side is more real than the good side. What you want to learn how to do is be able to label things from both sides, whichever is appropriate for whatever the unskillful emotion that's taken over the mind and the skillful emotion that you want to develop in its place. So as long as you're fabricating emotions anyhow, learn to do it with awareness so there's less suffering that comes. Again, it's a matter of not seeing the emotion as the real you or your real feelings about something but simply as something gets fabricated in the mind out of ignorance and cause you real problems if you're not careful. And it can bring you real help if you know how to fabricate things clearly with awareness, using your breath, using directed thought and evaluation, learning how to adjust the feelings in the body and the mind, how to change your perceptions, getting a clear handle on your emotions. So they can become a very helpful part of the path.